good morning. If you have a Bible with you this morning, turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 5 this morning looking at verses 27 through 30. Matthew chapter 5 verses 27 through through 30. We're going to be continuing this morning to look at deep righteousness. Uh, introduced that a few weeks ago, and we said that deep righteousness is a righteousness that's uh, uh, deeper than skin deep, that the Pharisees, the scribes, the religious leaders in the day, they had a righteousness that was just on the surface. It was skin deep righteousness. They looked good on the outside. They looked obedient externally to God, but inside they, they were kind of a mess. Everything was all mixed up on the inside. And Jesus Jesus said, skin deep righteousness is not righteousness, um, the kind of righteousness that God wants from you. God expects obedience. He expects external obedience. He expects us to do what he says, but he expects more than just external obedience. He expects us to, to have obedience that's in our minds, in our um, attitudes and our desires, those are going to be particularly important as we look at today, but deep within our hearts. And last week, we said over these next several weeks, we're going to see what that deep righteousness looks like. This is not all encompassing that we're looking at here, what Jesus says. There's things he's not going to talk about that still apply here, but the things we're looking at in this uh, sort of mini series within a series is kind of how that righteousness from the heart works its way out into your life. And last week, we looked at that in regards to murder, um, and this week we're going to look at it in regards to adultery and lust, adultery and lust this morning. Brooke kept the nursery last week, and she was uh, saying that she would check in. We have a speaker back in the nursery. She, she, she said, I kind of check into the, the sermon every so often. If you're in the nursery and not, right now listening to me, you can testify to this, but she checked in every so often, and she said every time she would listen to the sermon, she would hear me say the word murder or murderer. Like Those are the only words that she heard last week in the the nursery. So this week, I guess they get to hear adultery and lust multiple times in the service from back there. But listen, this is what we're looking at this morning. But I want to start by looking at the, the concept of boundaries, that, that all parents, all good parents anyway, set boundaries and rules and limitations for their children. All good parents do that. They set boundaries within which our children are supposed to exist and, and live. Before my oldest daughter could um, walk when she was just a little thing and still just kind of crawling, uh, we were living with my family at the time um, right after seminary, and my parents had a big bonus room, and in the bonus room, we had a big rug. It was a big giant rug that laid there on the floor, and that rug was her designated play area. That was where Kate was allowed to play and crawl around. And within that rug, within the designated area for her, there was relative safety for her, there was protection for her, and actually there was a lot of freedom. I know that sounds sort of confining, like just a rug, but she was little. And, and so, and, and there was freedom. As, as long as she was on the rug, she had the freedom to kind of do what she wanted to do. But beyond the boundaries, when you would go off the rug, that was where the danger lay for her. Because beyond the rug, beyond the boundaries, that was where we had a staircase that she could fall down. And that was where there were electrical sockets that she could stick her fingers into. And there were lamps to pull down. And there was sharp edges of furniture that she could bump her head on and get cut on. There was lots of things that could seriously cause her hurt and pain. One time she made her way off the rug and onto the staircase. And somehow, I still to this day don't know how it happened, but she got her head stuck in between the posts, the pickets on the banister. I don't know how she did it. I don't know she, how she got her head in the in, in between, but couldn't get it out. I think we had to like grease her head up and, and pull the post apart a little bit and pull her head off. And so from the time she was little and crawling around, we tried to train her, stay on the rug and it'll be good for you. If you'll just stay here, if you stay in this area that I've set out for you, then it'll be good for you. But guess what? If you've ever had kids and all of you were kids, do you know what she wanted to do as soon as we turned around? She wanted to crawl off the rug. It was the first thing she wanted to do. It was like there was some invisible voice that was calling to her from, from just off the rug, like, come off the rug. Come over here. It's good over here. It's so much fun over here. It's so much better over here. There's so much more freedom over here. If you just crawl over here, come off the rug and crawl down the stairs, you'll be happy. There'll be a happiness that you cannot find on the rug. But listen, the blessing was found in the boundaries. 
The blessing was found on the rug. And listen, God is a perfect father. He's not just a good father, but he's a perfect father. And God has laid out a rug for our lives. He set boundaries in our lives for the lives of his people, the lives of his children. And that, that those boundaries are there. He set those boundaries for our protection, for our freedom. And very importantly, he set those boundaries for our joy. But the joy, the blessing, Blessing is only found on the rug. It's only on the boundaries. And it's when we go crawling off the boundaries, off the rug, outside of what God has set up for us, that's when we get into trouble. That's when we take a tumble down the stairs. That's when we get our heads caught in the banister. We stick our fingers in the electric sockets. And I think one of the clearest illustrations of destruction that's found outside the boundaries is in the area of sexual relationships and sexual morality. But before we get to that, I want to set up just a real quick ground rule here. Very important thing for believers to understand. It's sort of a good thing, actually, and I feel like it needs to be said, and that is that God created sexual relationships, right? You know that, right? God created sexual relationships. It's not the devil's idea. It was God's idea. It's not something that we need to be ashamed of. It's not something that we need to run away from. It is from God, and it is good. And sometimes Christians are, are, are accused of like being anti-sex or something, but we're not. We're all for it. We support it fully. We're, we're, we're completely and 100% for it, but there are boundaries, and the boundaries that God set are not fuzzy boundaries. There's nothing unclear about it. There's nothing confusing about it. It's very clear boundaries that God has set. And what I'm about to say to you is me running and taking a leap right off the cliff of the cultural norms of our society. And I mean, I am going way outside of Main Street culture right now in saying what I'm about to tell you. But listen to this. This is not in step with culture. It is in step with God's word. And it's in step with the way God has created our world. Sex, listen to this, is only meant to be enjoyed in the context of a marriage relationship between a husband and a wife. That's it. That, that is the rug. That's the rug God's laid out. The, those are the boundaries that God has laid out. And those boundaries are fixed. They're not move, movable, and they've never moved. God has never moved on this issue. It's the same as it was right from the beginning. It was designed into who we are as people. And so God has not moved one inch on this. It is only people that have moved. Because people, you and I, we always, we want to push the boundaries. We always want to push the boundaries. We're always looking for a way to either push the boundaries or go outside of the boundaries to say, well, if what I want is outside the boundaries, then what I'll do is I'll push the boundaries until what I want, which is out there right now, is inside. I like I'll push the boundaries until what I want is inside the boundaries. But you need to know this. We don't get to move the boundaries. That's not for us to do. That was set and determined by God. It's not for us to get to move. We either flourish, listen to this, we either flourish in the boundaries or we fall outside of them. You either flourish inside them or you fall outside of them. You need to understand this and feel this and know this because everything in our culture is going to lie and call to you to come off the rug, to come outside of the boundaries, and to come out here. You need to understand that outside the boundaries is not only not blessing, but it's destruction. It's a destructive path, and the enemy will lie to you and tell you it is better out here, it's more free out here, but the freedom that the enemy promises to you is nothing but an illusion. It's only going to be slavery to another master, and so don't believe the lie, and I believe that God wants to free maybe even some of you this morning from sexual immorality, just like I believe that God wanted to free people last week 
from the destructive anger that gets set up and rooted into your heart that comes out in murder, the murder in your heart. God wants to do that in somebody's life this morning. I don't know if you're in here. I don't know if you're in the second service. I'm not sure, but I know that God wants to free people from sexual immorality. He wants to restore people that have fallen. He wants to help people that are in the midst of falling right now. He wants to give people repentance so that they can go back and live God's way again. That is what righteousness is. Righteousness is living your life God's way. And deep righteousness is living your your life God's way, not just in your actions, but deep within your heart. Living God's way is always the better way. And so if you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and look at the text. Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 27. The Bible says, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with, with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better for you, or better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. And so the outline this morning, again, is very simple. It's going to be the exact same outline as last week. We're going to look at the letter, the spirit, and the application once again. The letter, the spirit, and the application. So number one, and I like this because I don't have to think of a new outline for two weeks in a row. It's the same one. Very, very easy. Number one, the letter. Now, this is uh, real simple. I'm just going to spend just a minute on it here. Verse 27, in verse 27, when he says, you've heard that it was said you should not commit adultery, that comes from the Ten Commandments. This is the Seventh Commandment from the tenth, Ten Commandments. Last week, we looked at the Sixth, do not kill or do not commit murder. This week, the Seventh Commandment, Exodus chapter 20, verse 14, real simple. The Bible says you shall not commit adultery. You shall not commit adultery. So I want to answer just a couple of questions just to give you a, an understanding of what this is about and what this commandment itself is about. What is the letter of this command? So number one, what is adultery? What's adultery? Real simple definition. Adultery is any kind of sexual relationship between two people where one or both people are married to somebody else. Any kind of sexual relationship between two people where one or both people are married to someone else, not married to one another. It's not confusing at all, is it? Very, very simple. So that's what adultery is. Why, number two, why is it wrong? Why is it wrong? Why is adultery wrong? Why did God forbid it? And the very, very simple answer, just like last week with murder, the very simple answer is, why is it wrong to murder? Because people are created in God's image. Why is adultery wrong? Very simple answer. It's wrong because it destroys marriages, and marriage is something that's important to God and that matters to God. We'll look at that next week. Why is adultery wrong? It's wrong because it destroys marriages, and marriages matter to God. They're important to God. And the act of adultery is something that shatters and breaks that unique and deep and lifelong bond that's created between a husband and a wife. Again, we'll look at that next week when we look at divorce. And that is true, the, the shattering of that bond, listen to this, it's true whether or not you feel like that bond exists or not. It's true, regardless of whether your marriage is struggling right now, regardless of whether or not your spouse is unlovable right now. And you know, sometimes a spouse can be unlovable, right? The only way that you don't understand this is if you've just gotten married and you're still on your honeymoon. Your spouse can be unlovable, but that is true. That bond exists between a husband and a wife, regardless of whether your marriage is struggling, regardless of whether your um, spouse is being unlovable at that moment, and regardless of whether or not you think right now, I'm not in love with you at this moment, that does not give you any cover. Now see, the lie of our culture, our culture will tell you, yes, adultery is mostly wrong unless it's for love. That's what the culture says. Like, it's wrong 
and it's still kind of wrong, but if it's for love, it's okay. Like if you're not in love with your spouse anymore and you love the person that you commit adultery with, then you sort of get a pass. And what that does is that makes adultery a loving act if it's done for the right reasons. But can I tell you, marriage is never, a never an act of love. It's always an act of destruction. It's always an act, act of destruction. It destroys your marriage. It destroys the marriage of the other person. And it is the opposite, the complete and polar opposite of love. Both love for your spouse and love for the spouse of the other, uh, of, of the other person. So what is adultery? Sexual relationship between two people where one or both of them are married to somebody else. Number two, why is it wrong? It's wrong very simply because it destroys marriage, destroys a marriage. And then number three, the penalty. What's the penalty for adultery? Marriage, listen to this, marriage was so important to God that the penalty for adultery was death in the Old Testament law. It was death. You probably know this, but Deuteronomy chapter 22 Verse 22 says this, if a man is found lying with the wife of another man, both of them shall die, the man who lay with the woman and the woman. And listen what he says here, so you shall purge the what? Evil from, a, from Israel. Is adultery evil? Adultery is evil. He said it's something that needs to be purged, not only from your family because adultery is destructive to you as an individual, it's destructive to your marriage, it's destructive in your family, but God said here it's also destructive in your community. It is an evil that needs to be purged, he said, from the community of Israel. That is how destructive the path of adultery is. But now it's important, as before we move on, it's important for you to understand that even though there is healing, even though there is forgiveness, and even though many times there can be restoration, and I've seen it in some of the worst instances in people and, and in families, there is, there is always healing with God if you go to him. There's always, um, there's always forgiveness from God, and there can be restoration in the marriage, but you have to understand that the consequences of this one are severe and steep, very steep. If there's anybody in this room this morning, and I don't want to assume that nobody is battling with this temptation right now. If there's somebody in this room this morning that is considering walking off the rug and going down this path, you need to know the consequences are steep. They're steep. And God's way again, it's always better. God's way is always better. The blessing is found in the boundaries. That's the letter of the law. And if you're good up to this point, because maybe you're not struggling with committing this act, you probably won't be after the next one. This one might hit you just a little bit close to home. Number two, the spirit of the law. What is the spirit of this law? Verse 28 says, but I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And just like last week, what Jesus is doing is shifting the paradigm. The Pharisees, the religious leaders, they had their paradigm for how to obey these laws. We went from murder as an act to the anger in your heart, and this week he's shifting it once again. We're going from adultery as the act itself to the lust that is in your heart that leads to the act. Now, the religious leaders in the day, they mostly looked, looked at this and taught that this was kind of a problem property crime. This was essentially a property issue. In that day, the wife was seen as the property of her husband, and so adultery was like stealing. Adultery was like breaking the eighth commandment not to steal. And in case that sounds kind of misogynistic to you right now, it's really not. Paul goes on and clarifies in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians Chapter 7, verse 4, to tell us that not only does the wife belong to the husband, but the husband also belongs to the wife. So it's not just that I, I don't own my wife or she doesn't own me. We have a mutual possession of one another. We belong to each other. And so in that sense, the religious leaders were partly right. There was something to what they taught. It, it is robbery. It is stealing for you to have 
commit adultery with your neighbor's wife. But as usual, they didn't take it quite deep enough. It wasn't just robbery. It wasn't just stealing. Jesus said it's even deeper than theft. He said it's at the level of your desires. It is your desires. It goes deep down into your desires. Now, once again, again, I feel like I need to say this. Sexual desire in and of itself is not wrong. It's good and healthy. It's from God. But once, but, but what Jesus teaches us is that adultery is misplaced desire. So what is adultery? Adultery is misplaced desire. And misplaced sexual desire is what is destructive here. And he captures that in verse 28 with this key phrase here, lustful intent. He says that anyone that looks at a woman with lustful intent, lustful intent is this deep desire, it's epithumia, or, the, or the, this deep desire that you feel, this deep urge that you feel to take and possess somebody that does not belong to you. It's your desire. He said, even if you never commit the act itself, just the desire to have sex with or to possess somebody that does not belong to you and who you do not belong to, listen very carefully. He doesn't say that that desire might lead you to one day commit adultery. He said that desire, if you have that desire in your heart, you have already committed adultery in your heart. So Jesus said, Adultery in the heart is adultery. Adultery in the heart is still adultery. And just so nobody is confused here, this applies, what Jesus is teaching here, applies to all misplaced sexual desires. All desires that are pointed in the wrong direction, whether you're married or whether you're single, whether you're male, whether you're female, all sexual lust from either gender that's not directed at your spouse is adultery in the heart, he said. And I know that sounds heavy, and I know that sounds difficult, and I know that sounds impossible, but I'm just telling you what he said. Just telling you what he said. And it's interesting the way Jesus describes it here. The way he describes it, he says, it starts with the look. Where does that lust in your heart start? He said it starts with the look. Everybody who looks at a woman or a man with lustful intent. And that word looks here, it means more than just glancing at somebody, okay? You need to understand what the word itself means. It doesn't mean just glancing at somebody. It doesn't mean just seeing somebody. It doesn't mean like, it doesn't even mean this. Like you're just walking along and this beautiful woman comes walking down the sidewalk and you look and you say, wow, she's beautiful. That's all right. It's not just appreciating somebody's beauty. It's not you're walking down the road and this good-looking man walks by and like, wow, he is a really good-looking guy. That's not what he's saying. It's not just appreciating the beauty of somebody else. It's a different kind of look, and you all know exactly the look that I'm talking about here. It's like you're studying that person. It's like you're tracing all of their contours. It's like you're a cartographer mapping them out. You're gazing intently on them, and you're fixing that, that gaze on that person with an accompanied uh, 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 intent in your heart to have that person in your mind. And so this look starts this change reaction in your heart that activates this lustful intent he said so what does that mean practically it means you need to follow the kids song you remember the song you learned as a kid be careful little eyes what you see you didn't know that was just not just for kids right it's not just for kids all of us we have to be careful because it starts with that look it's that look that activates that lust in our hearts be careful about your looks be careful about how you look at somebody. And that leads to an issue that I think causes the downfall and the ruin in, in more lives right now than maybe any other thing related to this. Something that's fueling misplaced desire in our culture and in our society. And that's pornography. Pornography. Our culture has done everything that it can. Everything that it can to normalize it, to make it acceptable, to make it accessible. And they've done a really, really good job. A really good job with it. 
And if you look at the stats, the stats are heartbreaking. I'm not just talking about general society out there. I'm not just talking about the world right now. I'm talking about within the church. I'm talking about within Christians, particularly Christian males are maybe more susceptible to this than anyone else. But the statistics say, and if you believe the stats, the the statistics say that six out of every 10 Christian men look at pornography once a month at least. Six out of 10. Six out of 10. I'm not going to ask you to look around the room. Six out of 10. Well, the stats for women are not quite as high, a little bit lower than that, but apparently it's a, a growing problem even, um, even among women and Christian women. And listen to this. It's mind-boggling how early children are now exposed to this and teenagers are now exposed to this. It's more accessible than it's ever been before for your children and for your teenagers. And you need to be aware of it. You need to be aware of the danger. You need to not close your eyes towards it. You don't need to think, particularly if you're a parent, you do not need to think that your children are not going to figure out how to find it, that your teenagers are not going to figure out how to find it. If you have teenagers and you're not monitoring their internet usage, they probably won't like me for saying it, but you need to be. You need to be. It's too big of an issue. It's too important of an issue. And understand, pornography's sole purpose, the entire purpose for which it exists, is to lead you to look with lustful intent. And every time you look, you are committing adultery in your heart. And you need to understand that if you allow it to, if you let it, it will capture your heart It will hold you down, it will enslave you, and it will drag you down this path of guilt and shame and destruction. And I say all this out of love. I say this not to shame. I say this not to condemn if you're on that path right now, if you're struggling with that right now. I'm not trying to do that to you, but I want to warn you to see through the lies. See through the lies that it's normal, it's natural, it's harmless, it's healthy, It's not. It's not. It's dangerous and it's destructive. And it's a perversion of what's good. It's a perversion of what God created good. And it's outside the boundaries. You say, how's your thought life right now? How's your thought life right now? Are you walking around with undisciplined eyes and an undisciplined heart? Walking around committing adultery in your heart everywhere you go. Is that where you're at right now? I'm praying for freedom for you this morning. Number one, the letter of the law. Number two, the spirit. The spirit of this command is very simple. Point your desires in the right direction. Point your desires in the right direction. And then number three, the application. Look at verse 29. Jesus said, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. I don't know if this is obvious to you, but if not, I want to make it obvious to you. Jesus is not speaking literally right here, right? You, you all know that because you all have two eyes and, and two hands. There's nobody in here that's, that's taken Jesus all the way to his literal conclusion here. He's not speaking literally that we ought to cut our hand off, gouge our eye out. You do understand there's nothing that you can cut off and nothing that you can poke out that will ever cure this for you, Right? There was a guy, a Christian in the second and third century that literally castrated himself at this command. And guess what? It didn't work. But he was very bummed after that. It doesn't work because it's a heart problem. It's not a hand problem. It's not just an eye problem. It's a heart problem. And so when he says what he says here, he's using hyperbole, he's exaggerating this to make the point that if there's something that's so destructive that it would send you to hell, isn't it worth fighting with your whole heart to keep it from destroying you? What do you think about that? 
Is it worth it? Is it worth it to fight this with all your heart to keep it from destroying you, to keep lust and adultery in your heart from destroying you and your family and your children and those you love? Is it worth it to you? That's what he's saying. It's so destructive that you need to be willing to fight. So the question is, how do you fight it? How do I do it? How am I supposed to fight this? Well, there's a few practical things that you can do that are good things to do, things that you ought to do. There's practical stuff that you need to take action on. You can put filters on your computer. You can put filters on your children's computer, your teenager's computer. You can monitor that usage there. There's software like Covenant Eyes among many, 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 many different ones that you can put on your computer that will help filter it out. You can have accountability. You can have somebody that you can be vulnerable with, that can speak into your life, that you can be open with, that can ask you, how are you doing here? Pray with you, pray for you, that you can pray with and pray for, because it won't just be you, it'll be them too, so you can have accountability. You can watch the things that you put into your mind. You can monitor the way that you watch movies and television. I'm not telling you what you need to watch and what you don't need to watch. That's not my place to do that. But you need to be careful with the television you watch, the movies that you watch, the music that you listen to. Be careful with the the things that you're putting into your mind and into your heart. You can practice, particularly if you're a woman, you can practice modesty in dress. And I understand that that's not a very popular thing in our day and that people get mad at you for saying that. But I'm only telling you what the Bible says. I could probably list, you know, 10 or 15 practical things you could do. And all of those things are good. And you ought to do all of them. I mean, all of those things you ought to put into action in your life. They're important things. You should do them so you don't just continually. Because what you're doing when you don't do that, when you leave yourself unguarded like that, what you're doing is just continuing to like shovel fuel for lust into your heart and into your mind. You're just keeping on stoking that and building that flame up with inside you. The more you feed it, the more it grows. Isn't that true? And so you can and should do those things, but can I tell you this morning, they're not enough. They're not enough. It's not enough to do those things. You can do everything I mentioned and still walk around raging with lust like the castration man. Because once again, it's a heart problem. Jesus Jesus said in Matthew 15, verse 19, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, Murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. And if that's the case, and I think Jesus was telling us the truth there, if that's the case, then you can't just rely on negative behavioral modification here. You can't just rely on the things that you want to quit doing. See, remember, we're, we're fighting for change that's an inside-out change. It's not an outside-in change. It has to be an inside-out. And Paul says real practically in 1 Corinthians 6, 18, flee sexual immorality. But it has to be more than what you flee from. It has to be what are you fleeing to? It's not just what are you running from, it's what are you running to. And I want to challenge you this morning in two specific ways, real quickly and real simply. If we had time, there's much more that we could talk about on this, but for one Sunday, I think this will do it. I want to challenge you in two ways. When you look at not just what you flee from, but what you flee to. Number one, if you're married, if you're married, flee to your spouse. Start there. The Bible has given you a spouse that's to be the, the, the proper boundaries for all that we're talking about this morning. Flee to that person. Let that person satisfy you. Let that person meet your needs. Let that person be the, the sole standard of attraction in your life. And guess what? When you do that, when you pour that desire in that direction and not at all the thousands of other things that you can look at online and out down the streets and all this kind of stuff, then your spouse will continue to be that one that's beautiful to you. So flee to that person. Flee to your spouse if you're married. But then this next one, this is for everybody. This is whether you're married, whether you're single, Whatever, whether you're divorced, whatever status you might be right now, this is for you. This is for you this morning. Flee to Christ. Don't just flee from sexual immorality, but flee to Christ. Psalm 37, 4 says, Delight yourself 
in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Come to Christ and let Jesus shape your heart, mold your heart, shape your desires, all that's warped, all that's misplaced in you. Let him shape you and put it in the right place and in the right person. What we're really after in our battle with lust is a greater love for Christ. It's a greater love for Jesus. There was a man named Thomas Chalmers that perfectly captured this This idea here, he said, it is seldom that any of our tastes are made to disappear by a mere process of natural extinction. In other words, your lust isn't just going to disappear. But what cannot be thus destroyed may be dispossessed. And one taste may be made to give way to another and to lose its power entirely, very important as the reigning affection of the mind. What he's saying is, let your love and your affection and your desire for Christ grow grow so strong in your heart that he reigns there in place of your fleshly desires. And that goes perfectly with what we're saying in the Sermon on the Mount. We said the Sermon on the Mount is a kingdom sermon. It's all about what it looks like when Jesus is on the throne of your life, when he's the king of your life, when he's in charge of your life. What does it look like for you? And when Christ is in charge, it says he will dislodge and dispossess all the other reigning affections that try to sit on the throne of your heart. He will kick them out, and he will take his rightful place. And that applies, by the way, even to the king of lust in your heart. He will dispossess it from you when he reigns in your life.